How in James onto the heart and wild in Morton Park, galloping on fast and furious like Richard's right and narrow path of greenswood lying between the tall trees composing the right line of the avenue and the adjoining wood. Within it grew many fine old thorns, diverting him now and then from his horse, but he still held on until he came within a short distance of the chase when his attention was caught by a very singular figure. It was an old man clad in a Coarse brown surge with a hole drawn partly over his head, a raw girdle like that used by a cordelier sandal shoe, and a venerable white beard descending to his waist. The features of the bit such he seemed were majestic and then violent, seated on a bank overgrown with wild time beneath the shade of a broad armed elm. He appeared so intently engaged in the pursuit of a large open volume laid on his knee that he did not notice Richard's approach deeply interested, however, by his appearance. Said respectfully, Save you, father, pass on my son, replied the old man without raising his eyes. In the not my son, but Richard would not be thus dismissed. Perchance you are not aware, father, he said, that the king is about to hunt within the heart this morning. The royal cavalcade has already left on power and will be here many minutes. The king and his retinue will pass along the road avenue, as you should have done, not in this retired road, replied the hermit. They will not disturb me. I will gain no respect of your sleep, father, inquired Richard. You are in visiting of my return to her, and you will not fix in a pair of keen grey eyes upon you. I will satisfy your curiosity. If I so do it, I shall bring you your present. I am reading the book of fate. Richard is an exclamation of astonishment, and in it your destiny is written to show your mind. The sad one it is consumed by a strange and incurable disease, which may at any moment prove fatal. You are scarcely likely to survive the next three days, in which case he you love better than existence will perish miserably, being a judge to have destroyed you by which it must indeed be the of it that tells you this. I just spring it on his and approach it for May I cast my eyes on it? No, my son, replied the old man, pausing the volume. You would not comprehend the misty characters, but no eye except my own must look on them. What is written will be fulfilled. Again, I bid you pass on. I must speedily return to my hermit cell in the forest. May I attend you thither, father? asked Richard. To what purpose? rejoined the old man. You have not many hours of life. Go then and pass them in the fierce excitement of the chase. Pull down the lonely side. Laughter the savage war. And as you see the poor denizens of the forest perish, I think that your own end is not far. Hark, do you hear that falling cry? It is the stroke of a raven newly alive with ever attend the huntsman in the chase, in the hope of obtaining a morsel when they break oh dear, such is the custom of the bird. I what well, said the old man, but it is not in the joyous expectation of the raven born that he crows now, but because he fell in stink informs him that the living dead is beneath him. And as if in answer to the remark, the raven crows exultingly, and rising from the tree, wheeled in a circle above them. Is there no way of averting my terrible destiny, father? cried Richard despairingly. I did you choose to adopt it, replied the old man. When I said your ailment was incurable, I meant by ordinary remedies, so it would yield to you such as I alone can employ. The malignant and fatal influence under which you labour may be removed, and then your instant restoration to health and vigour follow. How do you, father, have arrived to Richard Eagle? You have simply to sign your name in the fort rejoined the hermit, and what you desire shall your fear is the end of the day. But the ink cried, which will prick your arm with your dagger, and did the end of the book lie the old man. That will suffice. And what follows if I sign demanded Richard, staring at him? Your insert will I will give you to keep up a wondrous illicit. But to what do I find myself as a Richard to serve you by the But it is at light service that only involves your appearance in this world once a year. Are you agreed? I know not reply the young man distractedly. You must make up your mind speedily, said the hermit, for I hear the approach of the royal cavalcade, and as he saw the mellow notes of a bugle followed by the baying of hounds, the jingling of hurdles, and the trampling of a large troop of horse were heard at a short distance down the avenue. Tell me who you are, cried Richard. I am the hermit of the wood, replied the old man. Some people call me Hoverse, and some by other name, but you will have no difficulty in finding
handing me out look yonder, he added, pointing through the tree, and glancing in the direction indicated, Richard beheld a small party on horseback advancing across the plain, consisting of his father, his sister, and Alison, with their attendant. Tis she, tis she, he cried. Can you hesitate when it is to save her? demanded the old man. Heaven help me, or I am lost fervently, ejaculated Richard, gazing on high while making the appeal. When he looked down again, the old man was gone, and he saw only a large black snake gliding off among the bushes, muttering a few words of angleness for his deliverance. He sprang upon his horse. It may be the arch tempter is right, he cried, and that but few hours of life remain to me. If so, they shall be employed in endeavours to vindicate Alison and defeat the snares of which he is beset. With this resolve, he struck spurs into his horse and set off in the direction of the literary. Before, however, he could come up to them, their progress was arrested by a pursuant riding in advance of the royal cavalcade, motioned them to stay till it had passed, and the same person, also perceiving Richard's purpose, called to him authoritatively he back. The young man might have disregarded the injunction, but at the same moment the king himself appeared at the head of the avenue, and remarking to Richard, who was not more than fifty yards off on the right, instantly recognising him, shouted, Come hither, young man, come hither, thus baffled in his design. Richard was forced to comply, and uncovering his head, was swollen towards a monarch. As he approached, James fixed on him a glance of a sharp scrutiny. Odds alive, you have been ganging a fine gate, young sir, he cried. You more be demented to ride down a hill in that fashion, as if your craig wore of no account. It's well he had come off scathless. Are you tired of life, or was it the mobile himself that rode on? Can ye find an excuse? Nay, then I'll give you any. The Lord Sain will draw nails out of a door, and there be glasses with a string, as the Lord Sain, that drag men to their perdition. Sans a magnet yonder, and he added, glancing toward the little room before them. Guide fear the last might be a horse to which to exercise sick influence, and we would fain see the effect he has on you when near Sir Richard Horton. He called out to the knight who rode a few paces behind him. We pray you present Sir Richard Ashton and his daughter to us. Had he dared so to do, Richard would have worn himself at the king's feet, for all he could venture upon was to say in a low earnest tone, Do not prejudge Alison, sire, on my soul she is innocent. The king prejudices no man, replied James, in a tone of rebuke. And like the wise prince of Israel, whom it is his wish to resemble, he sees with his aim end, and hears with his aim ears. Therefore, he forms conclusion. That is all I can desire, sire, replied Richard. Far be it from me to doubt your majesty's discrimination. Or look of justice. Ye shall have proofs of all man before we don't said ye. Ah, uh, here comes our horse, and the two lasses with him. She, we, the lint white, lost is your sister, we guess, and the other is Alison, and by our troth a well bored lass. But Satan is high, delusive, with mourn resist his snares. The party now came on, and were formally presented to the monarch by Sir Richard Horton, Sir Richard Ashton, a middle aged gentleman with handsome features, though somewhat naughty in expression, and the stately deportment was very graciously and James, though fit to pay a few compliments to Dorothy, covertly regarding Alison the while, yet not neglecting Richard being ready to intercept any signal that should pass in there. None, however, was attempted, but the young man felt he should only alarm and embarrass Alison by any attempt to caution her, and he therefore endeavoured to assume an unconcerned aspect and demeanour. We have heard the beauty of the Lancashire lasses highly commended, said the king, but if it passes expectation to her lovelier damsels than these we never beheld. For our rare specimens of nature's handiwork, your majesty is pleased to be complimentary, rejoined Sir Richard Ashton. That Sir Richard returned James, we honour him to fluttering, though after the before ourselves. Both our bonny lasses we repeat, and so this is Alison Nutter. It would be ill say in our own Scottish tongue to wish your Lancashire vernacular closely approximates Sir Richard all well there. Alison, he added, I knew her narrowly. You have lost your meter. He understands the young girl was not discomposed by this question, but answered in a firm and melancholy tone. Your Majesty, I hear, is too well acquainted with my unfortunate mother's history. I will we winner deny having heard somewhat to your disadvantage, replied the king. Your pain and 
Wolfgang Clark, Condic, Paul Fairmere, Claire Smith, in them Ben, Sire, Clyde, Alison, Sadler, Ah, oh, what? Then you and me will more the Zild, right, King Charlotte? I neither admit it nor deny it, Sire, she replied. It must be for your majesty to say. Well, answered Jim, but I must not forget that the deal himself can walk through her to serve his purpose. But you hold in abhorrence, crime, late your mother's charge, eh? He added aloud in utter abhorrence, replied Alison. Good, very good, rejoined the king. But entertaining this feeling, how comes it you swing so heinous and offender from justice? No natural feeling should be allowed to weigh in the sick case. Nor should it sire with me, replied Alison, because I believe my poor mother's eternal war would be best consulted if she underwent temporal punishment. Neither is she herself anxious to avoid of it. Then why does she keep out of the way? Why does she not surrender herself? Right here? Because and Alison stopped. Because what demanded Jim? Pardon me, sire, I must decline answering further questions on this subject, replied Alison. Whatever concerns myself or my mother alone, I will stay really I cannot compromise with her. Aha, then there are others concerned in the cry Jim. We all as much. We will interrogate the hereafter. But a word mark, we trust ye are devout and constant in your religious exercises and I will answer for that sire it was Sir Richard Ashton. Alison all time is sent in prayer for her unfortunate mother. If there be a fault it is that she goes too far and injures her hell by her zeal. I go fault that Sir Richard observed the king approving let it be seemed to me not to speak of myself sire said Alison and I am more to do so but I beseech your majesty to believe that if my life were offered as an atonement for my mother I would really yield it. I good faith she staggers me in my opinion for James and I mourn one to the matter more closely. The lass is far different from what I imagined her was the wiles of Satan and me to be comprehended and he will put on the semblance of righteousness when he seek to beguile the righteous and wheel damned when he added aloud he speak feelingly and properly and as a daughter should speak and we expect your feelings by that he is sick as he represent them and now disforge yourself all the chase and must pray in your majesty to this this he said Alison it is a sight in which at any time I take small pleasure and now it is especially distasteful to me with your permission I will receive a horse tower I also crave your majesty's lead to go with her said Dora I will attend them before the Richard now you more the same with us young sir by the king your good father will gang with them sir John Finney he added all to the master of the ceremony and the seat in his ear see that they be followed and that the special watch be kept over Alison and also over this new be marked back over the Asherton clan and now he cried in a loud voice let them walk the straight the chief huntsman having placed the bugle to his lips and blown a stride to win a short consultation was held between him and James who uncle to display his knowledge as a woodman and while this was going forward, Nicholas and Sherborne, having come all the squire, dismounted and committed Robin to his brother-in-law, or the monarch. If I may be so bold as to in a word, my lady, she said, I can assure you where a heart of ten is assured in regard I viewed him as I rode through the heart this morning, and cannot therefore be mistaken. His head is high and well palmed, radiant and in proportion, well heard and well heard. Stately in height, long and well fed. Did you mark the slot, sir? inquired him. I did my lead by Nicholas, and the long slot it was. The horse great with round short joint bones, large shin form, and the huge claws close together. I will hold him for a great old part as ever for offered, and one that shall show your majesty rest for, and will take your word for the matter, sir, said he, for your as good a woodsman as any we have in our dominion. Bring us to him then. Will it please your majesty to ride towards yon glade, said Nicholas, and before you reach it, a heart shall be for you. James assenting to the arrangement, Nicholas sprang upon his seat, and calling to the chief huntsman, they galloped off together, accompanied by the bloodhound, the royal cavalier, following somewhat more slowly in the same direction. A fair sight it was to see that splendid company rearing over the plain, their every cats and gay mantle glittering in the sun which shone brightly upon them. Giving promise that day when further advance we intensely hover. Present it was fresh and delightful in the whole company, exhilarated by the exercise and by animated conversation, were in high spirits. Perhaps amongst the huge party, which numbered nearly 300 persons, one alone was great to despair. But though Richard Ashton suffered thus internally, he bore his anguish with Spartan firmness, resolved impossible to let no trace of his own in his features or deportment and peace so far succeeded in conquering himself that the king who 
kettle waddle eye upon him, remarked to Sir John Binney as they rode along that a singular improvement had taken place in the young man's appearance. The cavalcade was rapidly approaching the glade at the lower end of the chase, when the lively notes of a horn were heard from the adjoining wood, followed by the debate of a bloodhound. Aha, they have aroused him, cried King Joyful, placing his own bugle to his lips and sounding an answer. Upon this, the whole company altered in anxious expectation. The hound vain loudly. The next moment, the noble heart burst from the wood whence he had been driven by the shouts of Nicholas and the chief huntsman. Both appeared immediately afterwards. By my faith, a great heart as ever was hunted, exclaimed the king. There, boys, there, to him, to him. Dashing after the flying heart, the hounds made the welkin ring with their cries. Many lovely damsels were there, but none thought of the cruelty of sort. None sympathised with the noble animal they were running to death. The cries of the hounds now were loud and ringing now deep, and Dolly, accompanied by the whooping huntsmen, formed a serving concert, which found a response in many a gentle boss. The whole cavalcade was spread widely about, for none were allowed to ride near the king. Over the plain they saw, bleak as the wind, the heart seemed made for a bell, forming part of the hill near the land. But here, he reached his relay station within the covert first hall, and turning the king aside, once more dashed to let across the road expanse, as if about to return to the old way. Now he was seen plunging into some bosky dell, and after being lost to him for a moment, bounding on the other bank and stretching it across a traffic covered river. Here he gained from the hounds who were lost in the new wilderness, and their cries were pushed over his face, and on they burst forth and came in the pack was soon again over, and the speeding over the open ground. At first, the cavalcade had kept them well together, but on the turn of the chase were very good, and the many of the names being unable to pull the hounds fell off, and as a natural consequence, many of the gallant were very kind to thus only the keen held on amongst these, and about fifty yards behind the king were Richard and Nicholas. The squire was right when he predicted that the heart would show them the sword. Plunging into the wood, the hard pressed Nicholas and Nicholas died in possession of his lair, but was speedily routed again by Nicholas and his huntsmen. Once more, he was crossed in some wide way into the town and huntsmen. After him, once more, he turned by a new relay, and his hand chased his horse towards the woods, skirting the dog. It is a piteous sight to see him now, his cold black and glistening. Where his mouth embossed with all his eyes, though big ears coursing down his teeth and his northern head carried all his ends seemed snatched for the hound door. Really soon to double their energies and the monarch hears them on. Again the whole beast erects his head. If he can only reach yon cot, he sees safe. Despair and moves him from the gigantic bounds and clears the intervening sails and disappears in branches. Quickly as a hound from after the bear, for he is taken to the soil side of the by the open branches he is on this way. Forcing his way through the wood, James was soon on the banks of the Darwin, which he around him, and so the heart was nowhere to be seen. Nor was there any slot on the farther side to denote that he had gone for. It was evident, therefore, that he had swum down the street. At this moment, a shout was heard a hundred yards lower down, proceeding from the Nicholas, and riding in the direction of the sound, the king found the heart at bay on the farther side of the street, and kneeling up to his haunches in the water, the king regarded him. Extreme attack, but he seemed determined to sell him quite ill. He stood on a bank, projected into the street, round which the water was deeply, and could not be approached without him there. And danger, he had already gone several pounds, whose bleeding bodies were swept out current, and though the others bade round him, they didn't dare to approach him, and could not get behind him as a high bank arose in his ear. Have I no majesty permission to dispatch him? As the old ballad happy and the adage is true, as we ourselves have seen, Nicholas, however, he did not go through, throwing his wood knife and his end, cumbering himself of his floor, he plunged into the stream, and with one or two strokes reached the bank. The heart watched his approach as if divining his purpose, with a look half menacing, half thoughtful, and when he came near, dashed his sandalwood head at him, nimbly eluding the blow, which if it had taken effect, might have proved serious. Nicholas plunged his weapon into the ball. With a heavy splash into the water. Well stricken, well stricken, shall James, who had witnessed the performance from the opposite bank. But how shall we get the carcass here? That is easily done, Messiah replied, Nicholas, and taking hold of the woman, he guided the body to a low bank a little below where the king stood. As soon as it was right ashore by the prickers, James was able to visit the river. 
reminded by a loud roar above him that a raven was at hand, and accordingly, taking a piece of gristle from the spoon of the brisket, cast it upon the ground, and the bird immediately pounced down upon it and carried it off in his huge beak. After a brief interval, the seat was again winded, another heart was roused, and after a short but swift chase, pulled down by the hound, and dispatched with his own hand by James, Sir Richard Horton then besought the king to follow him, and led away to a bird and hollow surrounded by trees, in which shady and delicious retreat preparations had been made for a slight sylvan repast. Upon a mossy bank in the tree, a cushion was placed for the king, and before it on the sward was laid a cloth spread with many dainties, including meats, tongs, powdered well, and jambons of the heart with sausages and a savoury canast to set men's minds. A god whole caverns and pigeon pies close at hand was a clear cold spring in the which numerous flasks of wine were immense. A few embers too had been lighted on which carbonadors of venison were prepared. No great form or ceremony was observed at the entertainment. Sir John Finney and Sir Thomas Horton were in close attendance on the monarch and the minister to his once but several of the nobles and gentlemen stretched themselves on the sward and addressed themselves to the viands set before them by the pages. None of the dames dismounted and few could be prevailed upon to take any refreshment. Beside the flask of wine there were two barrels of ale in a small cart drawn by a mule, both of which were brought. The whole scene was picturesque and pleasing and well calculated to gratify one so fond of sylvan sauce as the monarch for whom it was provided. In the midst of all this tranquillity and enjoyment, an incident occurred which interrupted it as completely as if a thunderstorm had suddenly come on. Just when the mirth was at the highest, and when the flowing cup was at many a lip, a tremendous bellowing, followed by the rushing of branches, was heard in the adjoining thicket. All started to their feet at the appalling sound, and the king himself turned pale. What in heaven's name can he, Sir Richard, he inquired? It must be a draw of wild cattle, cried Baronet, trembling. Wild cattle, ejaculated James in great alarm, and so near us sounds we shall be trampled and go deaf by the bulls of action. Sir Richard, ye are a horse traitor, thus you endanger the safety of your sovereign, and ye shall answer for it. Arm comes of it. I am unable to account for it, sire, stammered right and baronet. I gave special directions to the prickers to drive beasts away. You shouldn't keep sick devils in your heart, man, cried the monarch. Eh, what's that? And miss all this consternation and confusion. The bellowing was double, and the crashing of branches drew nearer and nearer, and Nicholas Ash rushed forward with the king's horse, saying, Mount, sire, mount, and away. But James was so much alarmed that his limbs refused to fall their office, and he was unable to put in the stirrup. Seeing his condition, Nicholas cried out, Pardon my liege, but at a moment of herald like presence, one must not stand on the ceremony. So saying, he took the king round the waist and placing him on his seat. At this juncture, a loud cry was heard, and a man in extremity of terror issued from the wood and dashed towards a hollow. Close on his heels came the draw of wild cattle, and just as he gained the very verge of descent, foremost of the herd overtook him, and lowering his curled head, caught him on the point of his horn, and threw him forward to such a distance that he alighted with a heavy crash almost at the king's feet. Satisfied, apparently, with their vengeance, or alarmed by the numerous assemblage, the drove instantly turned tail, and were pursued into the depths of forest by the brigand. Having covered his composure, James bade some of the attendants raise the whole wretch who was lying and groaning upon the ground, evidently so much injured as to be unable to move out of assistance. His guard was that of Forrester, and his whole ball he was stoutly and squarely built and contributed, no doubt, to the severity of the ball when he was lifted from the ground. Nicholas instantly recognised in his blackened and distorted features those of his third MD. What he exclaimed, rushing towards him, did thou, villain, the sorrow only replied by a look of intense malignity. Eh, hey, what ye can, what is this demanded again? By my soul, I hear the pure fellow has made of his veins broken. No great matter if there be, replied Nicholas, and it may say the application of Roger in case your majesty desires you have any questions to him. Chance has most strangely brought into your hand one of the most heinous offenders in the kingdom who has long escaped justice, but who will at length meet the punishment of his crimes. The villain is Christopher Dendy, son of the foul hag who perished in flames on the summit of Pendle Hill, and the captain of a band of robbers. What is the name of Warlock and Arriver? demanded James regarding Dendy with arms mingled with alarm. For sire replied Nicholas, and an assassin to boot. He is a diabolical villain. Let him be taken to Borden Tower and kept in there some strong and secure place so we have leisure to examine him said James, and see that he be visited by some skillful child. We would not have him die and see 
problem would then be to appear to be in a great agony and force himself to speak. I can make important disclosures to your majesty, he said it was and broke on. If you will hear them, I am not the only vendor who has escaped from justice. He added, glancing vindictively at Nicholas. There is another, a notorious witch and murderer who is still screened from justice. I can reveal her hiding place. Your majesty will not give heed to such villains. Fabrications, said Nicholas. Are they fabrications, sir? Rejoined James somewhat sharply. We mourn here the judge. The snake, though, soul will still bite his seat. We have hang it a Highland cataract about trial for this, and we may attempt to take the law into our own hands. Yet, bear the villain, hence, see if he falls off as already directed, and take good care he is to guard And now give us a crossbow, Sir Richard Horton, and bid our prickers drive the deer before us, for we will try our skill as a marksman. And while Demdi was placed on a literary board which had recently sustained a noble burden in the fall of heart, and in this sort of stage or tower, James Lord with a retinue towards a long glade where, receiving a crossbow from the huntsman, he took a favourable position behind a large oak and several birds here he driven before him. He selected his quarries and deliberately took aim at them, contriving in the course of an hour to bring down all fat and two mavens and many others which were pulled down by the hound, and with this slaughter he was content. Sir Richard Horton then informed his majesty that a huge boar which in the source phrase had left the sound of five years had broken into the heart the night before, and had been routing among them. The age and the size of the animal were known by the print of the feet at all, being round and face the edge of the animal. The heel large and the guards for two glory great and all from all of which appearances it was judged by the baron as a great old war not to be reviewed. James at once agreed upon him and the hound being taken away, six full of magnificent masses of the luxury were brought forward and the monarch under the guidance of Sir Richard Horton and the chief was repaired to an adjoining navigation with the four bed and couch. On arriving near his end, all sphere was given to the king and the prince advancing into the wood presently afterwards made their enormous Sally bore and dreaming furiously, he was instantly assailed by the massive, but notwithstanding the number of his assailants, he made light of them, shaking them from the bridge, he tried to shield them beneath his own feet, pushing at them with his sharp tusks, and committing the terrible devastation among them. Peter charges were made upon the savage animal by Jane, but it was next to impossible to get a war at him for some time, and when at length the monarch made his attempt, he was such a war and hit him on the snout, upon which they for finding himself wounded, sprang towards a horse and ridden all the with his noble charger and still go over on his side, exposing the royal prison to the fury of his merciless assailant. He must have loud and flesh if at this moment a young man had not ridden forward, and at the greatest personal risk approached the ball, and striking straight downwards, cleft the heart of the fierce root with his spear. Meanwhile, the king, having been disengaged by the prince of the sea, which was instantly put out of his agony by the sword of his huntsman, but all his deliverer and discovering him to be Richard Ashton was loud in his expressions of gratitude. Faith in mourn, claim a boon at our hands, said him. In mourn, never be, said the king, is great. What can we do for you, like? For myself, not in sire, replied the Or another mean apple, is that what you would have us infer? Cried the king with a smile. I will, the last, shall have to justice done her, but all your own. Fire into the matter, meantime, where this he had taken a magnificent sapphire ring on his finger, and if you should ever need our aid, send it to us as a boy. And Richard took the gift, and knelt to kiss the hand so graciously extended to him. By this time, another horse had been provided for the mono, and the enormous ball with his feet upwards and tied together was suspended on the ball, borne on the shoulders or stout bars as one for a chain, and the royal company issued from the wood to strike a man worn by the sheep. And such of the cavalcade as still remain on heel, or let it ever part of the direction of Orton Tower.